Welcome to the reading room. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Wing Tech Lum, the author of several books of poems, Expounding the Doubtful Points and the Nanjing Massacre poems. He is co-author of a poetry book, What the Kite Thinks, a linked poem. Wing Tech Lum has been published in many anthologies and collections and is the recipient of several awards, including the American Book Award and the Elliott Cades Award for Literature. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, Anne. Yes. Sure. Uh, now, you have published two books of poetry, and I understand you have a third one, uh, which is coming out next year, uh, called Expounding, Expounding Nanjing, The Old Timers. Uh, could you elaborate? Yes. Yeah. The first book that I published uh, was in 1987. It was published by Bamboo Ridge, and it's called Expounding the Doubtful Points. Um, I also have a second book that's been published by Bamboo Ridge in 2012, mm -hmm. and that's uh, The Nanjing Massacre Poems. Um, uh, so those are the two books that are already out. Um, I'm privileged to have a third book going to be published next year by Bamboo Ridge Press entitled The Old Timers. Well, congratulations. I, I look forward to reading it. Did, did you want to give us a little update on what, what it might be about? <clears throat> Well, the, the, uh, the third book, The Old Timers, is uh, trying to imagine what life was like uh, in Honolulu Chinatown around the turn of the last century, circa 1900. And so it deals with a lot of the old timers who were living at that time in uh, the camps and also in town, in, in the Chinatown area. Um, and so uh, I've tried to imagine uh, what they were thinking, what they were doing at that time. So. Oh, it's so always interesting to just go back in time, especially in Hawaii. There's a lot of interest uh, in mm -hmm. um, historical yeah. pieces. Oh, wonderful. And, but your first book included much more personal poems about your family, including a newborn uh, daughter mm -hmm. and your view of yourself as a Chinese American. Yeah. But the second and third books are clearly historical in mm -hmm. nature. Why, why the difference? Well, the first book, I guess I was growing up. I was trying to figure out who I was, <clears throat> what my background was with relationship to my, my ancestors, and then also um, uh, at that time um, my uh, newly born daughter. And then I also wanted to figure out how I was uh, uh, living in this particular world, um, especially as a Chinese American in, in, in the context of uh, America as a whole. And so I uh, try to deal with those kinds of issues. So it was a very personal book. And I noticed that uh, I was writing most of it uh, in the first person uh, voice. And it was um, uh, influenced especially by uh, the confessional uh, uh, genre of poetry uh, that has, had been written. Uh, in the previous decade. So I was influenced by, by those poets. Um, after that, though, I kind of got into uh, reading about especially uh, uh, a particular historical event entitled the uh, Nanjing Massacre, which um, uh, has to do with the Japanese invasion of China in 1937. And I thought, gee, maybe I would like to try to give voice to the people who are not able now to <clears throat> uh, tell their stories because they basically were uh, uh, they, uh, murdered uh, or suffered uh, in, in indescribable ways uh, by this particular occupation of uh, China at that time. And so I tried to uh, give voice to them uh, by these particular poems. And so. Um, it took me 15 years. There's about 104 poems in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just devoted myself to dealing with that, but using history as inspiration. And so, in fact, what happened was I was able to uh, get out of my first-person voice kind of limitation and uh, started to write in second-person or in third-person and um, imagine people other than myself mm -hmm. uh, and try to tell their stories, which you know became my stories. Yeah, 
Oh, wow, thank you so much. It's such a powerful book and really look, looking forward to the third mm -hmm. book uh, that's coming out. Um, so there's also many memorable scenes in your, in your books, expounding the doubtful points and uh, as, as we did discuss the Nanjing Massacre yeah. poems and in various publications. Could you give examples of how history informed your writing and would it be possible to read some of your yeah. work? Okay, uh, I've chosen <clears throat> a poem from my third book, uh, The Old Timers, and it's entitled In the Store. And basically, I got inspired by going through a lot of my grandfather's records. And so uh, he owned a store in Chinatown uh, in the 19, early 1900s. Um, and it was located on North King Street near Aala Park. <clears throat> and so um, I got a lot of information from a lot of different sources about the store and then kind of just thought about what I knew about Chinatown at that time. And I came up with this particular um, poem. And so I'm going to read the poem first and then I will try to share what uh, lines were influenced by uh, what sources. So the poem is entitled, In the Store. The rumors about the fight at the sugar mill swirl around the saltfish and traveler's plum. The sleek sausages hanging under the open transom, the dried scallops, fat medallions of gold sorted by origin in wicker baskets. Our barber comes in early to buy some young ginger, but stays a while to chat with the school teacher's petite wife who is looking for peanut oil. Before she leaves, she coaxes her toddler to recite a quatrain out loud. All the uncles applaud, and the little girl gets to choose a rock candy from a tall glass jar under the counter. In the far corner of the courtyard, besides blue bundles of fishing lines and nets, the letter writer at his table listens patiently as the house painter relates the death of his brother. The two agree, however, to omit any mention to his widow of how he had died of opium poisoning. As the two get up to leave, a kinsman who raises ducks by the marshes presses a small coin without a word into the painter's gaunt hand. At the long counter, the tarot farmer arranges with the owner to settle his accounts. He confesses the work in the fields is too harsh and he must return to care for his ailing wife. The government postman arrives with a thin envelope addressed to a stone cutter in care of the store. It is placed inside a locked drawer behind the main counter and will be picked up by the old man when he and his native wife stop in as usual the next Sunday. At noon, a clerk is sent out to buy vegetables. Another clerk doubles as the cook and everyone eats their lunches discreetly, standing at their stations. They leave the scraps for a pair of calico cats just enough to keep them coming around, but not enough to stop their hunt for rats. Rather than losing it again, a gambler sends his night's winning to his mother. The cashier collects his money and will mail a coded letter back to the village where an elder holds a chest of silver for the store. The purveyor of bean curd pudding asks to barter for this week's delivery. Instead of cash, he will exchange his whole freshly made bucket for their best grade of tobacco. Surrounded by large tins of assorted tea in the storeroom off the kitchen, the owner's son fills out the manifests and shippers declarations in between his English school assignments. Rice growers gather on the wide front lanai to complain about the sparrows, dark flocks swooping, devouring their crops. A few talk about buying a scattergun as a last resort. In the mezzanine where they keep imported abalone and decades-old tangerine peels, the fugitive and his supporters, heads bowed, murmur softly in earnest discussion about the next rally. Clerks later on clear out a space for a card table among the displays of kitchen crockery. After work, the owner and his buddies will stick around for a night of gin rummy. Newly arrived, a teenager is introduced all around, where he is from, whom he is related to, what manner of work he has done. The old timers take in his every word about home. <coughs> wow. 
So yeah. this poem was inspired by a lot of different sources. Yeah. Um, for instance, a lot of the different merchandise that are mentioned in the store, uh, I appropriated, or shall we say stole, from uh, documents uh, about my grandfather's store that I found in the immigration and naturalization service documents that are archived at San Bruno, California. Um, there's a mention of bl uh, blue fishing uh, nets and lines, and that's from an oral history that I got from my auntie about what she remembered about the store. Um, uh, there's uh, a mention of a, of a person returning uh, to the village uh, uh, because his wife was ailing. And that's from a story that a cousin uh, had told me from when she went back to the village and learned about the elders having to go back because the wife was ailing. The thing about the cats um, being fed just enough and, but not enough to stop their hunt for rats is, is kind of a, you know, something that everybody in Chinatown knows about. You know, you want to keep cats because there are a lot of rats around, even nowadays. Um, the, the, um, the sun filling out uh, the manifest, the shipping manifest, and is from an, uh, an essay that my father wrote when he attended uh, uh, UH Manoa, you know, a long time ago. He had to write this for class. The sparrows uh, are because of um, uh, a newspaper article that my uh, that uh, my grandfather quoted about how they, there were all these flocks of sparrows ruining all of the eating up all of the rice rice uh, crops. And the gin rummy is something that my father had talked about. His father uh, always playing gin rummy and gambling. So you know it's all of these different kinds of tidbits of information about my uh, family that I kind of just appropriated or stole. And then what happened was I was able to get inspired to try to put them all into uh, a single poem in some kind of a hopefully articulate way. Yeah. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that because yeah. it, it's, so, it's really vivid, the details in the poems. Uh -huh. And so I, I can visually <laughs> see myself yeah. in yeah. in the poem and mm. wow and I, I can see yeah all of that information just combined and it just like flawlessly just flows you know well, yeah. that, that part is the you know after you figure out all of these mm. items you kind of have to figure out how you to make it flow together and that's mm. part of the responsibility of the writers to try to uh, yeah. do that you know successful or not you just have to try to do that Oh, that, that's great. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, th that goes to our next question <laughs> about, we talk a lot about writing, mm -hmm. right? And especially when we visit various schools. And so in general, what is your writing process? Okay. First, I, as a caveat, every, every writer has their own different writing process. So what might work for me may not write, work for you or for anybody else, right? Um, but I can share what I do and or my philosophy or my perspective on how uh, I write, and maybe it has uh, you know some bearing with what other people are are doing or want to do. And um, <clears throat> I've given this little speech about my writing process a, a number of and a number of occasions, but it's not it's not just oh you know I get to sit down at the computer and start typing. Mm -hmm and finish off a poem. It's a long, long process. I include a, a first phase, which I entitle, um, I, I call it the um, uh, free reading or freestyle kind of uh, a, a phase, <clears throat> which is basically um, you know, reading a magazine or, or you know, uh, uh, trying to pick up some information about uh, some, something in history by reading a book or you know some, it's, it's uh, maybe I want to kind of uh, figure out what some of the contemporary poets are writing about now so I get a, a, a volume of poems what's what what is Anne Inouste <laughs> writing nowadays that kind of stuff and so 
I, I just keep reading <clears throat> and absorbing. I also, you know, try to listen when people talk, talk story with others and, and observe what's going on. And so all of that I try to absorb. And so that's what I call the first phase, which is just uh, waiting. But you're not just passively waiting. You're actively waiting. <clears throat> and at some point, there may be a hook, uh, something that just find, I find maybe ironic or you know, a little bit amusing or something unusual. Um, I use the word hook because that's what Lawrence Yep told me about how he was inspired to, to start writing a, a story or a novel or something. Uh, he found a hook and he, it, it kind of, he, uh, he couldn't let go of that. And so I also you know, have these moments where I say, oh, this is a pretty neat story. Maybe I can turn it into something um, like a poem, a short poem, long poem, whatever. And so I get these hooks. And I go through the second phase, which is I focus on something maybe that is tentatively something that I'm interested. I call it my percolating phase. Uh, people might say, oh, it's a stew, like cooking a stew or something, a marination of something, where you're focused on something and then, you know, maybe taking a shower or driving to work or whatever, uh, or just before uh, or going to bed, but before you fall asleep, you think about something. And you think about this little hook of a story, and that kind of becomes a little bit obsessive, you know. And, and so that's my second phase. And that could take a long time, and just thinking about it off and on uh, for days. <clears throat> and then the third is actually then a spark. And the image that I use is if you turn on a gas burner, there's this little spark that goes up, and then the gas will cause this flame to ignite, right? Get ignited. And so <clears throat> that spark to me is when I actually sit down and in the old days write uh, on a piece of paper with a pen or nowadays I can you know, type on my uh, uh, computer uh, the, the, where the white page gets something put on it tangibly. You know, and uh, the the thing that I the, how I describe it is um, flesh made word, mm -hmm. uh, and so th somehow you get to the point where you just want to sit down and you say, okay, I got to do it. I I have to put this down on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. It's very stressful. That that moment of to me, you know, maybe you're oh, no. <laughs> much much better, but. For me, it's very stressful to get to that point where I have the uh, ability um, and the confidence to sit down and start writing. And then when I start writing, sometimes it, I, I, I don't write too much. But often, because I've been percolating ideas, you know, there's more than just one sentence or two sentences. I kind of start, and then I can try to start uh, writing a lot more than uh, I ever imagined that I could, you know, could be uh, uh, not only three or four lines, but you know, maybe a stanza or a couple stanzas or something like that. It just pours out because I've been stewing or percolating on this uh, all this time. Then the fourth phase is really revision, which takes a long time, as you know, and I, you know, I, I um, and. Nowadays, it's easier. In the old days, I had to type something up and then I'd carry a piece of paper and, I'd, and a pencil and I'd look at it and I would, you know. But nowadays, you know, you have this, I have my iPhone, I typed it in and I can just pull it out and then I can just change a word or, you know, move, move something around or something like that, take out something. So that's the fourth phase. And the fifth phase is really Either you run out of gas, uh, or um, you, you know you think, well, it's it's perfect, it's done, pow. But actually, I have this uh, I have this um, other idea that no poem is ever finished, 
And I've been learning that um, because um, I'm working on the manuscript to my third collection. And my editor, Kathy Song, has uh, gone through each poem. And there are poems which I thought were perfect. And she said, this doesn't work, or I don't understand this, or something. And so, you know, I have to agree with her that maybe I should have looked at this particular line or this particular um, uh, image, you know, a little bit more carefully. And so I have to revise and revise. So I, I may have run out of gas, but the problem is I, the poems are not ever finished. They're always there's always room. So that's a kind of a long-winded mm -hmm. answer to your question of my process of how I, I write. Yeah, I, thanks so much for sharing because I think a lot of times people think it's inspiration is a short period of time mm -hmm. where, <laughs> you know, but I can tell you're absor absorbing everything yeah. around you, you're yeah. kind of pondering and it, yeah. um, it's all collecting and eventually until you uh, put pen to paper yeah. or, you know, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now the next question is, what about writer's block? Yeah, uh, I have mixed feelings about writer's block because, in a sense, if you you know listen to what I just said, is you know there's no excuse for having writer's block. You know, it's it's really a period of time where you're not writing physically mm. on a piece of paper, but you should be absorbing. Uh, observing, you should be actively waiting for the muse to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, approach. And and so, in that case, um, although you may think it's downtime, it can be turned into uh, the preliminary phase of writing a poem. And so that's that's kind of the way I see it. it, it it's a time that you can make good use of just by saying, okay, looking at it in a more positive way. Yeah, I'm not sitting down and, and working on my computer and finishing uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, poem. But you know, um, actually, it is a break that is healthy. And I'm absorbing and getting more nutritious ideas fruit, to bear fruit. In 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 a, in a you know in a, a way that will help this particular poem evolve and and grow and improve it. Okay. Wow, that, that's a great way to think I about it. I yeah. have a poem that mm. kind of describes <clears throat> some of this process um, uh, when uh, a friend of mine. This was uh, I think in the, in the 80s. He was saying, oh. I can't write anymore. I think I'm going to stop writing. You know, it's a big excuse, right? Um, and so I wrote this poem for him that kind of encouraged him to look at his downtime in a more positive way. Okay? And it's entitled, To a Poet Who Says He Stopped Writing Temporarily. I don't care what you do for a living, sell stocks or bonds or both. Drive a cab full time, wait on tables at that new jazz spot in Waikiki. I don't care what grand thoughts have moved you, the good image of your grandmother's smile, your delights at eating meatless meals, or that burning desire to let every child speak a language of his own. There have been the times when those wishful sentiments aren't enough, when you must lay aside all other claims on your life simply to satisfy that single, all-consuming craving. And now you are waiting, not merely driving home at night with the radio off, or washing your hair in the shower, or lying in bed face down, your lights out and the shades drawn. These periods are as essential as the moment you sit down in a rush, your favorite pen in hand, pulling out that journal you've always carried for this very purpose. And when the point scratches surface, flesh has, is made word, and these small truths of your existence illumine the page like laser light, scorching our hearts forever. Wow, oh, 
Oh, thank you so much for sharing that poem. And you're always encouraging, and I, I really appreciate your your thoughts on writer's block, where it's basically just a pause or like a um, a pause towards that next step of writing. And the good news is that that poet did continue to write. Yeah. So I can take credit for his, oh. <laughs> his next poem. So, oh. <laughs> and and you know, I, I notice you're always encouraging, you know, mm -hmm. to always to other writers, you know, where they're like, oh, I don't know if I have enough time to write, and mm -hmm. you're like, I'll write it, you know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, as you know, you're an award-winning author. Many people mm -hmm. appreciate your work and discuss your work in classrooms. Uh, think of a time before all the publications. What advice do you have anyone who wants to be a writer? Okay, well, my, again, this is my personal opinion, but I would say, don't think of the awards. Mm -hmm. That part is, is uh, you know, uh, not always going to happen and not always achievable and um, is fleeting if you do get an award. Um, when I think of your question, I'm thinking of um, something that uh, an artist, John Morita, told me uh, decades ago. Uh, uh, he said that um, sometimes artists and writers um, get too caught up in the prizes and awards and getting published here and there and whatnot, and they forget about uh, doing the actual writing. And so he gave this image or this metaphor of somebody always looking at the basketball uh, in the, um, putting a basketball uh, mm -hmm. in the hoop yeah. and forgetting about the dribbling. And so he said, we should think about more about how to dribble and learn how to appreciate and love dribbling for its own sake. Mm -hmm. If you uh, get to the point where you love dribbling, Yes, you might find yourself in front of the hoop and you'll be able to put the ball in because it's not, it's, 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 it's so easy. But maybe it's not the main focus. The main focus is to learn to love dribbling. dribbling. And so I would translate that to say, learn to love writing. Whether you get an award, whether it becomes published uh, in Bamboo Ridge or, or not, don't worry about that. Um, just, just concentrate on, on the writing itself and trying to find some meaning in the writing for your own self. Oh, thank you. Good advice. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for sharing your work and for being with us in the reading room today. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of the reading room. We would like to thank Wing Tech Lum for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.